Yesterday, Justin Trudeau unveiled more than $2 billion in rescue money for Canada's slumping energy sector and other key industries like tourism. Today, we are expecting to learn a little bit more about additional help for Indigenous businesses that may be taking a hit due to the pandemic. Justin Trudeau is also addressing the nation on a day that the Canadian military begin an operation to combat COVID-19. More than 100 uh, armed forces personnel, 125 if I'm not mistaken, are being deployed to Quebec to assist some overwhelmed staff in the province's long-term care homes. Quebec requested that help in an effort to contain the deadly outbreaks that are sweeping through the facilities there and, of course, in the province of Ontario as well. And that is a scene you are very familiar with at this stage, the front door uh, at the Prime Minister's, Prime Minister's residence, Rideau Cottage, uh, and we will hear from him in about 15 minutes' time. I want to bring my colleague Catherine Cullen, who's here to help with our coverage today. Um, Catherine, we have sort of reached a, a bit of a milestone in terms of testing. Uh, more than half a million tests have now been completed. And we know that testing is, is really key to trying to get a handle on things, but perhaps even more importantly, to, to trying to allow the economy to reopen and restrictions to loosen. And the Prime Minister has been asked those questions um, in virtually every day this week. Mm -hmm. That's right. And he, he does say that it's going to be key to moving forward. Any any sort of attempts to reopen the economy, testing is going to be an important part of that. That is, of course, in line with what we're hearing from officials around the world. Actually, the World Health Organization, um, an organization that we should say is under some added scrutiny right now, but it did put forward earlier this week uh, basically six criteria for any jurisdiction that's looking at moving forward. And widespread testing would be a part of that. Canada, uh, according to many experts, really not at the point it would need to be in order to reopen the economy. But even beyond that, there's still debate, certainly in some large jurisdictions, notably Ontario. This has really been a point of tension uh, with the Ontario Premier and his officials. They are still trying to ramp up testing to a level that everyone is uh, happy happy with right now, Rosemary, just to deal with the situation as it is, let alone talk of uh, mm -hmm. trying to let more people return to, I don't even think we can say their lives as normal. I think that's been clearly, uh, that point has been made clear, but to some sense of normal to see a little bit of a, uh, an easing of some of the restrictions. Yeah, and BC, and we'll, we'll talk to our reporter there, BC is already having that conversation. Of course, mm -hmm. they were testing at a much higher rate than other provinces, and uh, according to their public health officer, Dr. Hen Bonnie Henry, have essentially flattened the curve, so they will likely I would suggest to be sort of one of the first provinces to start easing off a little bit. There was a move last night, though, uh, that kind of came late in the day mm -hmm. uh, by the federal government to, uh, to to start, I guess, putting different measures in place as things ease up. That's right. Uh, that anyone now who enters a, an airport, anyone who's uh, doing any sort of airline travel, will need to wear uh, a non-medical mask, some sort of cloth face covering or whatnot. And, and, you know, that point is made by officials again and again when we're talking about members of the general public. They obviously do not want people using those medical masks, but more and more... I think anyone who has gone out of their house, seen people even walking by on the streets, those cloth masks. Now, if you are in an airport and anywhere where you cannot maintain that sort of physical distancing, as of Monday at noon, you're going to be expected to wear some sort of face covering. So that would be, of course, going through security, uh, any sort of ID check or whatnot, where you might be coming close to of uh, officials, border checks, uh, getting on the plane itself Monday at noon, you will be expected to have some sort of face covering. There will be exceptions made for children under the age of two and people who might have mobility issues or whatnot. Um, and again, this is for moments in the airport where you wouldn't be able to maintain that safe physical distancing. Obviously, it raises questions if this is happening in airports, and this also came with guidance for other modes of transit as well. Well, it wouldn't be a requirement. They will be encouraging people to wear those masks. Raise questions, raises questions about other places in society where people People are uh, unable to maintain that two meter distance as well, Rosemary. And we know we heard from Dr. New earlier this week. I believe it was Wednesday. He was asked in the briefing, could we see a scenario where there is widespread guidance that Canadians should be or must be wearing masks when they go outside? Obviously, that would be quite an evolution um, over the course of the past few weeks. Initially, they were saying, no, they don't want to see people wearing masks. There was concern that people would be touching their face too much. Now we're in a situation where public health officials have said, if you'd like to, you may. 
Could it be mandatory? Well, Dr. New said it's something that they're looking at right now. They're trying to uh, see how the science is evolving around all of this and where it might take us. Yeah, and other places like New York State, for instance, suggesting mm -hmm. now that it was saying now you have to wear a mask, particularly on things like public transport. And you could well see how if restrictions start to get eased, uh, other protective measures have to come into place and, and maybe masks become a, a required Part of thing. that picture. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, Catherine, I'll come back to you uh, shortly as we stand by and wait for the Prime Minister here in Ottawa. But obviously, the coronavirus continues to claim lives in long-term care facilities. It, more than half of the deaths in this country have occurred in those places. And because of that, some family members are choosing to bring their loved ones home. Eileen Smythe is one of those family members. She removed her 88-year-old mother, Ethel, uh, lodged from a care home earlier this week. And Eileen joins me from Barrie, Ontario. Good to see you. Thank you. How, how is your mother, uh, Ethel, doing, Eileen? Um, mom's doing uh, very well. She's uh, obviously happy to be home with family. Uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, she has dementia. She's unable to follow directions and, you know, she, she could possibly have mood changes and, and uh, all that. But uh, my husband is home as well. So between both of us, we're, uh, we're managing pretty well. Good. I'm glad to hear that. And and explain to people uh, how you came to this decision that your mom, who I think has, you said you mentioned has dementia, uh, how your mom needed to come live with you for a period of time. Well, um, you know, about the third week in March, I was reading the news and listening to what was happening in long term care. And it became very scary. I mean, a lot of people were dying. Uh, there was no help. Uh, the, personal support workers were scared to go and work at a lot of these homes. Uh, so my fear was that my mother would die alone. She's unable to follow any sort of isolation. Uh, so it became a nightmare for me. Uh, then I got a letter from the home stating that, you know, uh, they're not going to be uh, transporting the seniors who get sick to mm -hmm. the hospital. In other words, a similar situation, uh, who gets the ventilator? That I understand. But to, uh, to at that point, there, there was, you know, they were so low supplied with PPE, uh, you know, essentials. And uh, so when I heard families on TV and heard of families uh, in a nightmare where a parent would die and they wouldn't even know where the parent went, so they were having nightmares about that. And uh, so in the end, I made a decision that uh, after doing some calls to the government and finding out where I stood exactly to bring my mother home. And were there cases of COVID-19 at the time in, in her residence or have there been since? No, there were no uh, proven cases of COVID-19, and uh, which gave me uh, a good in to get my mother out because I'm not sure what the situation would be had there been one contracted there. Right. And, and I, I believe you're a part-time nurse, or you were working as a part-time nurse, so that probably gives you an advantage that other people might not have because it is a lot to take on. How much of a factor was that? Yes, well, uh, I still uh, work in the doctor's office in Barrie, and I do relief, but right now, as you know, the count's way down. So uh, I have this opportunity to be home, and as well, my husband as well. So between the two of us, um, uh, you know, we made that decision, and uh, I think I did make it at the right time. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so that made it possible for me, and I had had my mother prior to her going and being crises, getting admitted into the home, that gave me an advantage. Does it worry you about having to send her back? Because if, if, if anything, uh, this pandemic has exposed, Eileen, that, that long-term care centers um, obviously are struggling this, during this pandemic, but maybe we are not doing enough for older Canadians uh, across the board. Well, um, the government could be a little bit more lenient uh, to families who want to take their loved one home. It was mm -hmm. a real dilemma for me because when I called the action line, uh, you know, the Ministry of Health, uh, the lady um, told me that my mother would lose her bed 
that yeah. she would go on the waiting list as pre-admit and um, not sure when she would get back in. So my question to her was, is the pre-admit over or below the crises list? Because I know the crises list is probably a couple of thousand. So she couldn't answer that, but she did leave the phone, came back with an answer and said, she said, it's below the crisis list. Mm -hmm. At that point, I had um, emailed my local MPP and uh, voiced my concern and also emailed, uh, you know, detailed email. Right. I heard Matt back from that office three days later and I was, uh, you know, he said that he would put it to his superiors, but I have not heard anything since. Right. So my last phone call was to uh, CCAC, who deals with uh, mom's particular area. She explained to me that my mother uh, would go on a um, readmit list, but she would be a priority at the very top. Good. If I call them within the 90-day span from now or this past week, then I won't have to go through the uh, paperwork so that the next bed that becomes available at uh, the home will be available to her. Now, yeah. if I go past the 90 days, as you said, this may go on, yeah. then uh, what am I going to do? Right. So that is, uh, that's an issue for sure. All right, Eileen, uh, I know many people have, are struggling with these same issues, and I know it was a difficult decision uh, for you to make, but I, I can tell your mom's uh, still full of life and is probably very happy to be there. So I'm wishing you and, and Ethel and your husband uh, good health and uh, take care during all this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Eileen Smythe in Barrie, Ontario. And I should tell you that there are in Ontario now more than 100 homes, uh, long-term care homes that have outbreaks of COVID-19. So we're talking about almost one in six homes. Um, and that has been sort of the picture, not only in Ontario, but definitely in Quebec and to some extent in British Columbia as well. So let's go now to the CBC's Megan Batchelor in Vancouver because um, BC is ahead of the curve, has flattened the curve and is now already, Megan, talking about ways to reopen and, and what that might look like. Yeah, Rosemary, we're seeing some new data coming out of BC that was released yesterday, and Dr. Bonnie Henry giving us reason to perhaps be a bit cautiously optimistic that some restrictions could start to get lifted. And we are seeing a slowdown in the increase of cases in BC, especially compared to some of those hot spots across the country, in particular in Ontario and in Quebec. Um, BC is also changing the way that it's doing its modeling. It used to compare the number of cases to those in Italy or in Hubei province in China, those real hot spots, the epicenters at one point of COVID-19. Now, though, they are not comparing the worst case scenarios from there, looking at what could perhaps ha happen to our medical system here because we are starting to see this flattening of the curve. So now uh, officials here are starting to develop new models, looking at the cases that are happening short term and projecting those, assuming that there's no change in the current measures. And they're also looking at what could happen if they start to ease some of the physical res uh, distancing restrictions. So they say that now with the restrictions in place, um, contact between British Columbians is 30% of normal and so they do say that they could go up to 60% of normal and not see a re-emergence of COVID-19 in BC. They are though, Rosemary, still um, looking ahead at that second wave that we keep talking about and officials here are preparing for that and adjusting their modeling for that as well. Okay, Megan Batchelor in Vancouver, thank you. Very different picture, of course, on the West Coast. And mm -hmm. that is part of the issue here with COVID-19 is that um, uh, the public health, the chief public health officer, Dr. Teresa, his time has talked about regional, regional epidemics, right? Every province looks a little bit different. And so easing back some of those restrictions uh, will happen on different timetables in different parts of this country. And that will make it challenging, likely for the federal government who only has so much say in how this is going to unfold.
world. Uh, as we wait for the Prime Minister, he is expected to be on time. I'll bring back my colleague, Catherine Cullen, although I may cut you off, Catherine, so fair warning. Yesterday, um, yesterday the, the Prime Minister really made a significant number of announcements in terms of money, um, and one of them was to address the oil and gas sector, although it was in no way a bailout, and there is some criticism inside industry that not this is not enough, that this is not going to get them through everything. Uh, but there was there was also the, the the premier also was very welcoming to it, as were many environmentalists. Indeed, they put forward uh, quite a substantial amount of money. I believe it was one point seven billion dollars to deal with orphan wells, decommissioned oil wells, uh, as well as another significant chunk of money. And I am watching that doorway uh, closely, as you are as well, Rosemary, um, to deal with helping those within the oil and gas industry um, embrace, I guess I could say, new methane emissions. This is something that the prime minister said industry had expressed concern about whether or not they would be able to do it. Uh, and so the government is putting forward this new money in order to assist with that and that is why they're getting this thumbs up from uh, many environmentalists who are saying helping oil, the oil, oil and gas industry uh, reach a higher environmental bar is a pretty good way to spend public money. Of course the big question uh, many are asking has to do with the number of jobs created by this and uh, in the case of the orphan wells I don't know if I have the numbers right in front of me but certainly thousands of jobs that they're hoping it's that this does create. I think if I remember correctly. Yeah uh, well oh. we can see the Prime Minister right yes. there so let's uh, Let's, let's, to let's go to him. Yeah, here is the <laughs> Prime Minister of Canada. Thanks for that, Catherine, speaking now on a Saturday. I want to start today by confirming that Canada and the United States have agreed to extend by another 30 days the border measures that are currently in place. This is an important decision and one that will keep people on both sides of the border safe. It's another example of the excellent collaboration between our two countries, and I want to thank Minister Bill Blair for leading the discussions with the United States. This morning, I want to begin by confirming that Canada and the United States have agreed to extend by 30 days the current border measures. This is an important decision that will protect citizens on both sides of the border, and I want to thank Minister Blair for leading those discussions with the United States. We're all here today, but it is the weekend. And usually, a Saturday morning in April means getting outside to enjoy the sunshine, having a friend over for coffee, or just taking the kids to the park. But these aren't normal times. We're living through an unprecedented public health emergency, and we need to keep responding accordingly. So even as the weather gets nicer, and even in the weeks to come as we start seeing hopeful news, we can't let up. Because if we do, we could lose the progress that we've made. Last, uh, later today, you may see some new ads with people you know, like Haley Wickenheiser, Chris Hadfield, and Dr. Tam. And they'll remind you to stay home and save lives. That's how we keep each other safe. So stay at home. Limit your trips to the grocery store to less than once a week. If you do go out, keep two meters distance from each other and as you do your part, know that we're here to support you. Later today, you may see ads showing people that you know, like Laurent de Vernier-Tardif, David Saint-Jacques, and Dr. Mona Nimer, our science advisor. They will be reminding you that uh, you can save lives by staying home. As I've often said, everyone must do their part. In recent weeks, we have announced uh, historic measures to help you to get through this crisis. With uh, the emergency benefit, the wage, uh, the wage benefit and the loans for small businesses, we are supporting millions of families and workers right across the country. However, there is still work to be done. There are still people we need to help. So today, I am announcing further measures uh, to support Canadians. Our government will allocate more than $306 million to help 
indigenous businesses. This funding will be provided through financial institutions and the National Association of Indigenous Associations. This will allow them to get an interest-free short-term loan and non-refundable contributions so that they can get through this crisis and rebound afterwards. The investments announced today will help thousands of businesses to hold the line until things get better, including many uh, businesses uh, that are led by indigenous women. These businesses recruit people in every sector right across the country, and this is only a first step. Very soon, we will be announcing other measures to support indigenous businesses and their employees. I am very happy to announce that the government will allocate more than $306 million to give Indigenous businesses the support they need. This funding will be provided through Aboriginal financial institutions and administered by the National Aboriginal Capital Corporations Association. It will allow Indigenous businesses to access short-term interest-free loans and non-repayable contributions so they are better positioned to make it through and rebound after this crisis. Today's investment will help thousands of businesses bridge to better times, including many that are owned and run by Indigenous women. These businesses employ people right across the country, in small communities and big cities alike. They create good jobs in a whole range of sectors, so when we support them, we're supporting families and workers, too. And this is just a first step. We'll have more to say soon on what else we'll do to help Indigenous businesses and the people who rely on them. Small business owners are at the heart of so many communities. And this is a tough time, whether you own a store, a restaurant, or are part of the hospitality sector. So we're going to be there for you with this new investment and with measures like the Canada Emergency Business Account, the wage subsidy, and the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, we're focused on helping you. It will get easier, but until it does, we need to be prepared to persevere. And that includes ensuring that our frontline workers have the equipment and tools they need to do their jobs and stay safe. Yesterday, two planes full of N95 masks and coveralls arrived in Canada. More shipments will be coming in this week, coming in this weekend and into next week with additional medical supplies. I can also announce that we will begin receiving deliveries of face shields from Toronto Stamp very soon. They've shifted from their usual production of rubber stamps and ID badges and will be providing millions of face shields over the next two months. Canada, continue de recevoir Canada continues to receive shipments of individual protective equipment. Yesterday, two planes arrived full of N95 Max and coveralls, and other planes bringing in medical equipment will arrive over the weekend or during next week. We are all very anxious to see when this will be over. We are all anxious to see a Saturday when we can meet with friends or take our children to a birthday party. That time will come, but only if everyone continues to do their part. So this weekend, please stay home. Continue to follow the experts' guidelines, and together we will get through this. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. We'll now go to the phone lines for some questions. Just a reminder, it's one question, one follow-up. Operator. Thank you. Merci. La première question, Michel Lamarche, TVA Nouvelle. À vous. Good morning. I have a question about this agreement uh, with respect to the closure of the U.S.-Canadian border. We are concerned about not having enough uh, medical equipment and medications. Do you believe that this uh, agreement includes the same mechanisms in terms of timelines, or have you improved it? No, it's exactly the same mechanisms. We expect 
that essential goods and medical equipment and other items will continue to cross the border between our two countries, and that's what we will continue to ensure. Agreement is the same terms, just extended for another 30 days. Uh, it will ensure that we continue to get uh, essential goods and services back and forth across this border. Ms. Vivi? Follow up? Bien sûr, par rapport, yes. Uh, with respect to those masks that were supposed to be coming from 3M, we know that it was extremely complicated because of the directives announced by President Trump. Did you not think it would be a good idea to get some additional guarantees so that all those companies providing gowns and masks and so forth can continue to uh, provide that equipment to Canada so that we don't have to continue to rely on China. Yes, it is very important that we continue to receive essential protective equipment from around the world, including the United States. And we were very pleased to be able to ensure uh, the continuity of 3M shipments. But we will continue to work closely with the U.S. administration so that we are sure to receive all the equipment we need. Prochaine question. Mélanie Marquis, La Presse, à vous la parole. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Trudeau. Marc Garneau announced uh, that uh, airline travelers will now have to wear a mask that covers their face. Now, is it possible that recommendation will be extended to other groups? Now, with respect to Minister Garneau's announcement, I should point out, of course, that we are currently prohibiting all non-essential travel. We do not want people to start traveling, whether they're wearing a mask or not. Of course, it's better than uh, to wear a mask, uh, and, but we still want people to stay home. And we believe that this measure will help people in situations where physical distancing, like in a plane, is very difficult to achieve. Now, regarding the measures being put in place, once we begin to relax the current restrictions, Certainly, that is still under discussion, and we are having lengthy discussions with scientists as to what the best measures would be to ensure the protection of all Canadians. And we will have more to say about that as uh, those discussions continue and that reality become, comes closer. Yes. As a follow-up, Mr. Trudeau, with respect to the agreement between Canada and the United States on the border, there was a problem with respect to an asylum seeker, and that person was sent back. Now, has that uh, condition been changed at all in the new agreement? No, it is the same agreement that is being renewed for a further 30 days, and we will continue to ensure that our values and principles as a country are respected. Thank you. Next question. Operator. Merci. Thank you. Next question. Theresa Wright from the Canadian Press. Your line is open. Good morning, Prime Minister. Uh, the Conservatives want four in-person sittings each week in the House of Commons with a reduced number of MPs, and they argue that the daily ministerial announcements happening in front of the media could be done in the House of Commons. What's wrong with that? I think, first of all, it has been extremely important that uh, every single day uh, the Canadian uh, public uh, gets informed of measures that we're putting forward. Uh, we are putting forward new measures almost every single day, and I think uh, it is uh, essential that the media continues to have access to asking questions uh, to better inform and, uh, and ensure that uh, Canada is functioning the way it needs to be. Part of that job in our democracy is ensuring that there is accountability through our parliamentary systems, and that uh, is something that we are uh, also very much focused on. We have proposed uh, that the House of Commons uh, return in some fashion every single week to permit uh, engagement on accountability and also uh, pass further measures to help Canadians. Uh, 
Right now, we're in a situation where um, MPs across the country and their staff uh, are wondering if they're going to have to get on planes tomorrow and uh, fly to Ottawa. Uh, obviously, that is not something that, from a public health standpoint, uh, we should want to see happening. Uh, but right now, on the books, the rule is Parliament needs to reopen fully on Monday. Uh, that's obviously not a good idea, which is why we've proposed uh, measures going forward that we're discussing with the other parties, and we certainly hope that we're able to come to an agreement uh, so uh, that we don't all have to convene in, in, uh, in the House of Par uh, Commons uh, on Monday morning. We are still in discussions with the other parties. We have proposed that the House of Commons sit every week to ensure that there is an opportunity to ask questions of the government and also to be able to pass other measures that will help Canadians. The reality is that Monday morning, 338 members of Parliament and their teams are supposed to be in Ottawa. They are expected to be in Ottawa then so that Parliament can reconvene. Obviously, that would not be a good idea in the current context. Now, we have made proposals to ensure that uh, we can get work done and keep our democracy working and healthy while also keeping people safe. And we really hope that the other parties will, will agree with these uh, proposals because I do think it would be a ter terrible problem if we all had to return to Parliament on Monday. Uh, yes, many people on social assistance programs are surviving on less than people who are getting the CERB, and many marginalized Canadians will simply never be able to access the CERB as it is structured. Rather than continue to tweak it, why not just make the CERB universal? Um, we moved very quickly on replacing income for people who lost a paycheck because of COVID-19. These are uh, families who were relying on that next paycheck to be able to pay for their rent, to be able to pay for groceries, to be able to support uh, their children and their parents. Uh, these are. This was the absolute priority that we needed to move forward uh, quickly on. And uh, with the moves that we, uh, we were able to make, uh, over seven and a half million uh, payments have been made already, and there are obviously many more to come. At the same time, we recognize the particular vulnerability of uh, marginalized communities, of particular, uh, particular groups, and that's why uh, we have put forward significant measures uh, to try and help them, whether it's through uh, shelters, through support for uh, charities and uh, charitable organizations, uh, or uh, extending measures so people who work a very small amount of hours uh, a month uh, can still uh, receive the CERB. These are the kinds of things that we're looking at, and we're continuing uh, to move forward on getting the help out to people that we need to. Thank you. And we'll take one more question on the phone. Operator. Merci. Thank you. Next question. Christopher Gouli, Detail. Your line is open. Good morning, Prime Minister. You've been holding regular conference calls with the premiers during the COVID crisis, but why have you not reached out to the opposition leaders in a similar way, particularly when you're governing in a minority parliament and one that has not been convening regularly? Uh, we have been in uh, very close and ongoing conversations with opposition leaders, uh, both me directly and uh, mostly through uh, ministers and officials and regular briefings that happen from, uh, from uh, Health Canada and officials to keep people apprised uh, on these issues. But you're absolutely right that we do need to keep our institutions and our uh, parliamentary principles strong, which is why uh, we've proposed that Parliament could come back in a modified uh, way every single week to ensure accountability, to ensure that we can move forward on legislation. And uh, that's what we're very much hoping uh, we're going to get agreement on from, uh, from all parties, uh, because the alternative would be returning to Ottawa on Monday morning with a full House of Commons and all the staff associated with. And I think uh, we can all recognize that that would be a, a, a mistake at this point. And a follow-up, Chris? Yeah, some of the changes your government has made, though, to the Canada Emergency Response Benefit for Workers, the Wage Subsidy Initiative for Businesses, and the recent revisions regarding emergency loans and commercial rent assistance for small businesses were proposed by the opposition parties. So do you now think that looping in the leaders 
could save valuable time and get programs and money out the door sooner. Uh, we have been looping in leaders and opposition members from the very beginning. Indeed, uh, the proposals on uh, expanding, on filling gaps, have come uh, from MPs of all parties, including many, many Liberal MPs who have been uh, passing the message through. Uh, we know that Canadians are uh, working together in unprecedented ways to fill gaps and to respond uh, to these challenges. And it is wonderful, quite frankly, to see uh, so many suggestions coming forward. Many of them that make it into uh, tweaks and improvements and changes to programs uh, that are designed to help as many Canadians as possible. It is a, a great sign of collaboration and, uh, and solidarity of Canadians working together on leaning on each other, on being there for each other, uh, just like we're seeing outside of the political world as well. Hi, Prime Minister. Chris Logue with Global News. Today you said small business owners are at the heart of so many communities, but small businesses are terrified the, about the possibility of getting out of this and having enormous debt piled onto them in the form of rent deferrals and loans. The fear is that if they're either going to run out of money now or a year down the road, these businesses have legally been forced to close and yet still legally have to pay rent utilities. Have you considered financial aid that would not have to be repaid or discuss rent for forgiveness or control with the provinces? We uh, have discussed uh, the issue of commercial rent with the provinces. I had a good conversation with them on Thursday evening where this came up. Uh, we are looking at it uh, very, very closely. We have a number of proposals uh, that are working their way through the system, talking to various uh, industry groups and, uh, and uh, renters associations, as well as uh, looking at the provinces. The provinces have jurisdiction over uh, rents and the relationship between uh, landlords and tenants, so uh, we need to work with them, which is what we are doing. We recognize there are uh, very different realities and systems right across the country, but we also have heard very, very clearly uh, from small business owners that the uh, wage subsidy is helpful, but fixed costs are a real concern, uh, and that is uh, something that we're going to have more to say on soon. Ian Wood, CTV News. Uh, Prime Minister, BC has seen some success flattening the curve and has indicated they might look at loosening restrictions. Um, you've said it's too soon to be doing this, and meanwhile, provinces like Ontario and Quebec are still in the thick of it. Are you concerned a difference in messaging and measures will enable people to disregard what's in place now? And are you going to allow provinces to make the decision on reopening, or will the federal government need to give a green light? I think Canadians understand that what we are doing now has been tough, uh, but is essential on getting through this in the best possible way. And Canadians are also really worried uh, that if we reopen too quickly or too soon or in the wrong way, we could find ourselves back in this situation uh, a couple of months from now, and everything, everything we will have sacrificed during these months uh, will have been uh, for naught. So, uh, we are being very, very careful uh, in how we move forward as a country. Uh, I have spoken extensively with the Premiers about this issue, and everyone recognizes how cautious and careful and vigilant we need to be. Uh, there is a real desire to ensure that we are coordinating our messages, our guidelines, the principles that will underline how we move forward. But of course, the situation is very different right across the country from one region to the next. Uh, and the measures that they will be able to move forward with in, uh, at various moments will vary as well. Uh, that's going to be an important part of the recovery here. Uh, we need to make sure that we're working together as we have been in an unprecedented way uh, between uh, premiers uh, and, uh, and the federal government and municipalities and various other communities uh, uh, to make sure that we're doing the right kinds of things uh, and that we're sending the right messages to Canadians every step of the way. But the message uh, remains that we have to be extremely careful to do this the right way in a coordinated uh, and collaborative way. The Canadian meat industry is saying um, it is facing a crisis as processing plants have to close or slow production because of COVID-19. And the Canadian Federation of Agriculture has said that your government needs to prioritize food production so we don't have shortages. Uh, we've heard the government is considering all options, but what are they so that Canadians can feel confident that they'll be able to buy meat and food in the coming months? I think ensuring uh, the continued flow of uh, groceries and our food supply chains is absolutely a priority. But so is arresting the spread of COVID-19. 
So is ensuring uh, that workers in all industries across this country can remain safe. Getting that balance right requires us all to step up very carefully because we need to make sure that, yes, we are continuing the flow of uh, you know, great Canadian food uh, to people. And indeed, uh, we need to ensure uh, that we have as much uh, domestic food security and stability as we possibly can. And that means taking advantage of the summer months that are coming up and the growing season uh, and the planting season now. At the same time, we have to make sure we are doing things that are keeping you know, farmers, agricultural workers, producers and transformers safe. Uh, and that is what we're very, very much attentive to now. Good morning, Prime Minister Ashley Burke, CBC News. Harvard research, researchers have suggested that there needs to be at least 500,000 tests being done a day in the U.S. in order to safely reopen the economy. What is the, sp the specific number of tests that Canada needs to hit daily to safely ease up restrictions here? I think every, uh, every day we are working on new technologies, on uh, better coordination, on accelerating the pace of testing. Uh, it has been somewhat... Uh, and even across the country, there are places that have done very, very well. There are some places that have faced challenges that they are busy overcoming. But we are confident we are going to be able to significantly ramp up testing. And all the premiers recognize that extensive testing is an essential part of uh, any plan uh, to loosen the controls on, uh, on people and uh, start uh, reopening or restarting the economy. Uh, this is something that the federal government is very much engaged in with, uh, with the provinces, ensuring there are enough tests, there are enough swabs, there are enough reagents. Uh, th these are the kinds of things that uh, we are all working on together. We know we have to do much more than we're doing now, and we are tracking towards doing that. Uh, many of the cases in Canada have come from those returning from the U.S. Trump's talked <clears throat> continuously about reopening the U.S. You said today the border agreement is going to stay in place. But if the U.S. does loosen some restrictions in the next few weeks, what kind of health threat does that pose to Canadians? We have uh, the border restrictions in place uh, where uh, non-essential travel across the border uh, will not be permitted. Uh, we will continue to take the measures necessary to keep Canadians safe while ensuring the continued flow of uh, our es essential supplies supply chains uh, on which uh, so many Canadians depend. Okay. Uh, nous allons continuer. We will continue to be very vigilant about our borders and travelers coming from abroad, and we will continue as well to work with the Americans to ensure our own safety by maintaining the current uh, measures at the border. At every step of the way, we will do what is necessary to protect Canadians and ensure that our supply chains remain open. Prime Minister, I'm wondering if you can tell us what the impact on Canada's stockpiles has been for PPE when the government closed so many of its warehouses across the country. Um, over the past weeks, we've been uh, focused uh, on uh, delivering uh, PPE to the provinces, on delivering the necessary equipment to uh, ensure uh, that our frontline workers who are uh, putting uh, their uh, lives forward to keep Canadians safe uh, are properly protected. Uh, the uh, efforts continue. I mentioned uh, uh, two plane loans coming in this, uh, in this, uh, over this weekend, uh, more coming in over the coming days. We are confident uh, that we are in a good place around PPE and will only get better as more and more Canadian producers and suppliers uh, come online. It has been uh, something uh, extraordinary to see the level to which Canadian manufacturers have been uh, stepping up to get involved. Uh, and we are uh, in a much better place than we were uh, a number of weeks ago. Of course, uh, there is uh, a need for continued vigilance. And there will, of course, be many lessons learned on how Canada can be better prepared for uh, any future outbreaks uh, than we were this time. Bonjour, Monsieur Trudeau. Philippe Vincent Foisy de Radio-Canada. Radio-Canada. Um, Good morning, Mr. Trudeau. I have a rather simple question. Why are we extending the closure of the border with the United States? Is it because you are concerned that President Trump may want to lift the current measures? Or do you think that uh, they are not able to properly manage the pandemic? What is the reason? Well, we closed our borders to international travelers many weeks ago. 
And that included people from every country in the world. We took a few days more to do that with the United States because we needed to ensure that this could be done in a coordinated manner that would allow us uh, to keep our supply chains open. And we wanted to do it in cooperation with our closest partner and ally. So these measures were absolutely critical in order to protect Canadians and limit the spread of the virus. And we will keep them in place uh, uh, in relation to the United States and all the other countries around the globe for many, many weeks to come. A number of weeks ago to close our borders to international travelers. We recognize that this was a significant measure, but it was an important one in order to prevent uh, further spread of COVID-19 from coming in from overseas. Uh, it has uh, contributed to why we are now in many parts of the country talking about uh, uh, seeing a flattening of the curve, which is good news. Uh, we included the United States uh, in those measures because um, these are measures that we put in place around the world. We did take a couple more days uh, to ensure that we were properly coordinated with our closest neighbor and uh, most important trading partner. Uh, and that was very, very effective in it being a mutually agreed on and carefully coordinated measure. We will continue those measures both with the United States and with the world uh, for uh, what is undoubtedly going to be uh, many more weeks. With respect to the negotiations with the opposition about Parliament, why has there not been any agreement yet? You're able to agree with the United States. What is blocking an agreement? Can you not put some water in your wine? Well, we are dealing with a situation where a number of members of the various parties agree that we should move forward with measures that will require or lead to a limited parliament every week, but there are also others that want a parliament to be sitting four or five days a week, and I don't think that's the right thing to do. It's not the right balance, and we are pursuing those discussions now. Uh, many parties, uh, opposition parties, are in agreement that uh, limited sittings every week uh, are a good measure to both ensure accountability and uh, continue the uh, work that we're, uh, we're needing to do to pass legislation for Canadians. Uh, we are, of course, uh, looking forward to being able to see more virtual parliamentary sittings that will allow MPs from all around the country, not just uh, from the National Capital Region, uh, being able to participate. Uh, there is uh, one party that still wants uh, um, more than I think is wise at this particular time in terms of a public safety approach and in terms of uh, ensuring that we, are, um, that we are getting that balance right in moving forward for uh, protecting our institutions. Uh, but we are hopeful that we're going to get to a good place soon. Merci tout le monde. Okay, that is the Prime Minister of Canada on this uh, Saturday morning briefing Canadians on his government's uh, actions to fight COVID-19. Um, let's bring in the CBC's Catherine Cullen. Catherine, I, maybe I'll just pick up where the Prime Minister left, left off because it is um, of significant interest, obviously, in Ottawa, mm -hmm. but it should be of interest to everyone because if no agreement is reached, 338 people have to get back here for Monday uh, for Parliament to sit. Yeah, and we know, Rosemary, when we look at the two uh, extraordinary sittings we've had thus far during the course of this outbreak, that when a deal has been reached, it's been sort of an 11th hour thing. So I think we're going to see a lot of people, those who are engaged in this issue, uh, biting their fingernails. You know, there was that little twist of optimism from the Prime Minister at the end there, saying that he hoped that a deal could be reached uh, soon. But there is something of a face-off happening between, mm -hmm. primarily it seems to be his party and the Conservative Party. I should say I was speaking to the government House Leader's Office. They say they do have a deal with the Bloc Québécois, that they are close to a deal with the NDP, which the NDP tells me is a fairly uh, decent assessment of, of what's happening right now, that they are really at odds with the Conservatives. Uh, now let's throw another element into all of this. Uh, Elizabeth May, the Green Party, she was tweeting earlier this morning um, that if there is some sort of agreement that would require, as she put it, frequent returns to the House of Commons, well, she would jump in. Somebody from the Green Party would say, no, we won't give unanimous consent to that. We won't let that happen because she thinks it's a public health issue. Uh, she was engaging on Twitter with the Conservatives' government house leader, Candace Bergen, who said 
that she essentially agrees that everybody having to come back on Monday would indeed be irresponsible. It's not a good idea, although she seemed to be, it was implicit and not explicit, uh, putting the responsibility for that on the Liberals. She says we need a deal in order to make this happen. She mentioned that uh, Parliament just isn't ready for a virtual Parliament. That's something we hear from Andrew Scheer time and time again. And we do know that the government um, asked the Speaker to look into this process, but that it's something that would take a bit of time to establish. Um, I think anybody who has been on a work conference call can perhaps recognize by why anybody who's been watching any of the parliamentary committees, certainly there are some technical difficulties that make accountability challenging. At the same time, the public health concern here is a big one. I should also note that Candace Bergen, though, um, you know, you heard the prime minister say some parties want four or five days a week. I don't think anyone is actually asking for five days. Candace Bergen specifically tweeting that what they'd like to see the government do is three days a week, 90 minute sessions. Uh, she asks that she says that would be with a limited number of MPs. I think that's also important to flag that nobody seems to want a situation yeah. where, where all 338 MPs are back. Uh, she asks why that would be too much. I think we heard some of that answer from the prime minister as he suggests that it is a, uh, a public safety, uh, uh, too much of a health risk. So the negotiations continue behind the scenes. Not clear whether or not what happened uh, just now. The comments by the prime minister are going to move the discussion <laughs> along. Uh, I think we're going to have to keep uh, watching our email, Rosemary. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. The other bit of big news, and, and this concerns everyone, of course, the Canada-U.S. border. Yes. Uh, so, you know, a lot of Canadians may say, hey, listen, status quo, this is just another 30-day extension. But it's really interesting to watch what's been happening day in and day out with these conversations, uh, these questions that the, the Prime Minister is being asked by the media, because repeatedly reporters ask him to acknowledge what is in many ways, I think, obvious to a lot of Canadians, particularly if you look at what's happening, let's say, in New York State right now. Uh, they say, sir, is it not apparent that the United States poses an enormous risk to us? And the Prime Minister just does not want to uh, acknowledge that, however self-evident it might be. Perhaps, uh, and I don't want to speculate about what's going on in the Prime Minister's mind, but obviously there's this question of whether or not he might provoke the United States. And mm -hmm. we have seen the government sort of uh, lurching around a couple of times over the course of this outbreak as they try to deal with unexpected news coming from the United States. First, there was that report uh, of the possibility of the U.S. putting troops on the border. There was also this question of whether or not Donald Trump was going to prevent 3M from sending those much-needed N95 masks to Canada. Uh, so this status quo news undoubtedly a relief to government officials in Canada. I think it was also interesting towards the end of the conversation, Rosemary, the Prime Minister said something to the effect of the deal with the United States that it was undoubtedly going to be many more weeks. Now, he noted mm. that this deal extends for another 30 days. Not clear whether he was suggesting uh, an extension beyond that as well, whether or not that's something Canadians will be seeking. Of course, we know things change so much in the course of a day. Uh, who knows sure. where we're going to be in 30 days. Um, but certainly, I'm sure a relief for the Liberals that they have pushed that particular mm -hmm. issue back for another 30 days. Yeah. Okay, Catherine, that's great. Thank you. I will, we'll come back to you if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. I'll put you on standby. I will just also mention that we talked about before the Prime Minister spoke, now the requirement to wear masks if you are uh, getting on a plane. The Prime Minister making it very clear uh, that he still doesn't want you to be traveling, that non-essential travel should not be happening. But if you are required for some sort of reason to get on a plane, you do have to now uh, wear a mask. Okay. Uh, the other substance of the announcement, though, uh, was the decision to allow $306 million in uh, loans and some uh, non-refundable payments to uh, Indigenous small and medium-sized businesses. Um, this is another sector, obviously, that's been hard hit by COVID-19. We saw the government try to get money to particular sectors yesterday. A bit of a continuation of that today. If I'm not mistaken, there are something like 6,000 um, Indigenous businesses across this country. Tabitha Bull is the president and CEO of the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business, and she joins me from Toronto. Good to see you, Tabitha. You too. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So th this is um, how needed was this going to be? Was there a real desire for additional money for specifically indigenous businesses? Absolutely. Uh, there are actually over 50,000 indigenous businesses across oh. Canada and yeah. about 99 percent of those are small medium enterprises. Um, about March, around March 20th, we sent a letter actually to uh, the Prime Minister and the COVID Cabinet, along with a number of our friends, uh, including the National Aboriginal Capital Corporations, which the Prime Minister mentioned today, um, highlighting that a number of small and medium enterprises, very low number of those actually access financing through traditional financial institutions. So we wanted to ensure that there was a way that uh, small and medium enterprises could access some of the same liquidity and capital that was 
going out through the BPAC and through the Community Emergency Business Account. This is a much needed and welcome announcement. So this is, uh, this is because a lot of Indigenous companies use Indigenous institutions, banking institutions primarily. So this will go directly to those instead of a traditional bank, as you say. That's right. And, you know, a number of Indigenous businesses are also, about 65% of them are financed through their own personal savings or through personal loans. Um, so they're not an existing client of a financial institution. Mm -hmm. And the SIBA, is, it's very clear, is for existing clients in those institutions. So uh, we really needed another, another route for those businesses to access some capital and liquidity. The, the other thing that struck me uh, from what the Prime Minister said was, and this is something that we're seeing throughout various sectors, frankly, through the pandemic, is that many, um, many of these businesses are owned and employ women, Indigenous women. Can you give us a picture of that and, and how important it is? Because I, I know it's hit other sectors hard, too. A lot of women in the service industry, for instance. Um, give us a picture of that in terms of Indigenous businesses. So we definitely see women uh, more, double the uh, amount of women are innovating and coming into the Indigenous entrepreneur. A lot of that is, you know, it helps for them to be able to have a flexible schedule, not unlike women across the country. But a lot of the sectors that were hit initially are more sectors where you would have a personal interaction. So um, spa and uh, mm -hmm. tourism, and those are sectors where we see a lot of more women-owned businesses. So we have seen a, a higher impact to Indigenous women for sure. Are there, um, are there other things that are needed? That, that, that was the other thing that struck me. The Prime Minister said this is just the first step. Uh, as we know, these, these policy decisions that are getting made very, very quickly and pushed out the door very quickly are sometimes not the final version. Uh, is there anything else that you are looking for? Yeah, definitely. You know, we've been working very closely with the government on a number of the programs that are already, um, have already been established. Um, you know, I don't think it's intentional, but there's a number of of factors in those programs that excludes Indigenous businesses. So the wage subsidy, as an example, mm -hmm. um, Aboriginal Economic Development Corporations, who are a limited partnership with their community, but employ you know up to 800 uh, Indigenous people in a number of those organizations. They're currently excluded from the wage subsidy um, just by the way that their limited partnership is set up. So we're working okay. very closely with the government to try to understand that. Um, some of those businesses have laid off over half of their employees. And those are businesses who put money right back into programming in the community. So we need to ensure that they're able to access that wage subsidy. I think additionally is um, procurement. We have a number of Indigenous business members that are able to supply PPE and able to pivot to ensure that they, we can all fight COVID-19 together. Mm -hmm. And I'd really like to see some type of incentives so that we can ensure that those Indigenous businesses have an opportunity to be part of this fight against COVID-19 particularly when they can support loss of life in Indigenous communities who are at a much higher risk for this pandemic. You're talking about companies that are switching over their supply lines or their, their supply chains to create different things that are needed, like masks and that kind of thing? Yeah, definitely. We have seen a couple of our Indigenous business members who have pivoted to um, uh, ethanol and producing hand sanitizer, mm -hmm. and a number of businesses, too, who have been able to access uh, masks and um, you know, another great business, uh, Abreflex, that has uh, been able to pivot to making gowns. So we want to make sure that those businesses have an opportunity to be part of both the federal supply chain, but also to support directly to communities. Okay, Tabitha, good of you to make the time for us on this Saturday. I do appreciate it very much. Thanks very much. Okay, stay well. All right, and that, is, of course, is the Prime Minister's substantive announcement around financial aid today, $306 million of uh, loans or non-repayable um, funds to go to Indigenous specific businesses, of which there are many across this country. Uh, I want to go now to Quebec to get a picture of how things are unfolding in that province. It, of course, one of the hardest hit places in this country, not only in long-term care centres, but uh, across the province. But we have seen, of course, the outbreak in long-term care centres in that province. Uh, particularly hard hit, just like it is in Ontario. So let's go to the CBC's Matt Damore. He's in Montreal. And maybe let's start on that point, uh, uh, Matt, because I do know the Premier was asked about that yesterday and had some pretty frank comments uh, on uh, his assessment or the evaluation, the evaluation of his own government in dealing with this. Yeah, really what we heard yesterday from Quebec's Premier François Legault was kind of a mea culpa about how the government of Quebec has handled the situation in long-term care facilities during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so much so that the, the government actually asked for assistance from the federal government to get 
Canadian Armed Forces members to come into the province and to help out in some of these facilities. And that's actually starting today. There are going to be about 125 uh, Armed Forces members who are going to be deployed in Quebec to help in these facilities. Uh, we heard from the Canadian Armed Forces that that is starting at a specific uh, long-term care facility in Montreal. Uh, in fact, uh, by noon, people should be in that facility. And we're talking about nursing officers, uh, technicians, and other support staff who are going to be going in there mm -hmm. to try to help out. Now, Premier Legault essentially said that there is a deteriorating situation in these long-term care facilities. In fact, uh, more than half of the deaths recorded in Quebec attributable to COVID-19 have happened yep. in these long-term care facilities. Uh, now, the Premier said that uh, his government should have uh, tackled the situation in these long-term care facilities sooner, uh, especially this issue of chronic understaffing. And he said that uh, before this pandemic, the government okay. should have acted quicker on trying to get uh, higher salaries in these places to deal with Matt, the chronic overstaffing. Matt, I got, uh, Matt, I'm sorry, I got to let you go because I'm just going to end the special on the main network. Thank you for that. Matt Demore in, in Montreal you can watch us on CBC News Network. Okay, we are back. Welcome to our CBC News special coverage live from Ottawa. I am Rosemary Barton. Thanks for joining us on CBC News Network. We're streaming around the world on our app and cbc.ca. We are standing by at this hour for the daily uh, briefing from federal cabinet ministers and public health officials. Just last hour, the prime minister gave his own update. Uh, he did uh, reveal that his government and the United States have agreed to keep the border closed to non-essential travel for another 30 days. That was set to expire at the beginning beginning of next week. So an important move there by the federal government to keep travel restricted and to keep that border um, really restricted to only essential, uh, only essential workers going back and forth, for instance. He also announced some additional funding to help indigenous owned businesses. That news comes as parts of Canada have begun to address the possibility of easing restrictions on physical distancing. British Columbia says it hopes to potentially start relaxing some of those rules next month. The city of Toronto today is holding some talks about laying out a potential timeline for its reopening, even though it is still many weeks away from allowing that to happen. This is all in the planning stages. The prime minister, of course, has said that, that it will be weeks still before Canadians will be able to go back to some sort of sense of normal life, even if that just includes going to the park, for instance. COVID-19 continues to kill Canadians every day, particularly, as we know, in Ontario and Quebec's long-term care homes, about half of the deaths in this country attributed to what is happening in, in those places, the severe outbreaks and the inability to contain or move people from long-term care centres. All right, uh, as we wait for this briefing to get started, I'll bring in the CBC's Catherine Cullen. She is standing by in Ottawa. I'm just trying to think, was there anything else there from the prime minister that, that stood out other than the border, which is which was hugely significant in terms of public health, given as we were talking about um, the fact that, that things are very tough. And you know what? I'm, I'm going to have to come back to you because I see that the <laughs> president of the Treasury, Jean-Yves Duclos, is speaking. So let's uh, go now to that press conference. We have completed tests for over 507,000 people with 6% Confirm cases. Bonjour tout le monde. Au nom de la docteur Tam qui on behalf of Dr. Tam, Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, I will begin with the usual daily update on the number of COVID-19 cases in Canada. There are now 31,884 cases, including 1,309 deaths. 507,000 tests have been completed, with 6% confirmed positive. Dr. Tam said that there is some cause for cautious optimism coming from the data. This still holds true. But we must remain vigilant, stay focused, and keep our eyes on the ultimate goal, which is limiting the spread of this terrible virus to protect our families, our friends, and our fellow Canadians. In certain regions du pays, l'épidémie some parts of the country will experience the epidemic slowing down earlier than other parts of the country. But no matter where you live in the country, 
everyone must remember to keep doing the things that are helping to stop the transmission of COVID-19 in our communities. This includes washing your hands frequently, practicing physical distancing, and staying home as much as possible. Unless we all remain diligent in maintaining these very good new habits, new outbreaks can be sparked anywhere at any time. Some parts of our country will experience the epidemic slowing down earlier than others, but no matter where we live in our country, everyone must remember to keep doing the things that are helping to slow down and then to stop the transmission in our communities. This includes washing our hands frequently, physical distancing from one another, and staying home as much as possible. Unless we all remain diligent in maintaining our new habits, new outbreaks can be sparked anywhere at any time. Remember, as Dr. Tam also said, this is not a sprint, this is a marathon. And we need to keep doing and keep doing the right things and keep being strong all together. Ensemble, nous traverserons cette crise en... We will get through this together. Let's take care of each other and keep hope. And now, an update on the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. As we know, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, or CERB, is helping millions of Canadians and families who are facing financial hardship. As of April 16th, 6.4 applications had been filed for a total of 7.9 million applications many of which have already been processed. A very quick update on the important Canada Emergency Response Benefit, which is helping millions of Canadians, workers and families go through the very difficult economic times of the crisis. We, as of April, 8, as of April 16th, we have received a total of 7.9 million applications from 6.4 million different applicants. Six of these uh, 7.9 million applications, 7.6 million have already been uh, treated. Aujourd'hui, j'ai la chance d'être en compagnie du ministre Mark Miller. Here with me today is Mark Miller, Miller, Minister of Indigenous Services. Also with us today, Dr. Wong. Mr. Mark Miller, who is Minister of Indigenous Services and of Dr. Wong. So I would first turn to, doc, to Minister Miller, to Mark, and then to Dr. Wong. Mark. Merci, Jean-Yves. Thank you, Jean-Yves. Good afternoon. Sego. Bonjour. I want to start by saying that over the last few weeks, Indigenous communities have taken many positive measures to protect their populations in the face of COVID-19. I want to recognize their important work and the strength that they've shown. To the First Nation, Inuit and Métis leaders, elders and youth, your continued leadership and insight is integral to ensuring that we advance preparedness, planning and supports that meets actual community needs and protects the most vulnerable, as we are all focused on the public health response that will save lives. In addition to the previously announced $305 million in funding to address immediate needs and to help Indigenous communities prepare and react to the spread of this virus, this morning the Prime Minister announced $306.8 million for Indigenous businesses as we recognize their unique needs. These businesses are the backbones of communities across this country, and they are integral to the vibrancy of the Indigenous economy and the Canadian economy. While larger Indigenous businesses may already be clients of mainstream banks, we recognize that smaller Indigenous businesses may be disproportionately affected by this unprecedented and unique situation. These businesses may and are already facing unique challenges such as being in rural or remote locations and having less access to capital. The emergency funds announced today will be provided to Indigenous businesses through the 59 Aboriginal financial institutions, enabling them to keep supporting the thousands of small 
and medium First Nations, Inuit, and Métis businesses, a great number of them run by women. It will help stabilize Aboriginal financial institutions and will allow for short-term interest-free loans and non-repayable contributions, offering maximum flexibility in supporting local businesses and ensuring they are well positioned for the recovery to come. We, of the, we are aware of the challenges that many Indigenous communities face in the territories, especially when it comes to air transport necessary for food supplies and other essential supplies. At the beginning of the week, we announced financial support of $73 million to support Yukon, the Northwest Territories, and Nunavut so that they can slow the spread of the virus based on their needs and priorities. We will continue to work with our Indigenous partners everywhere in Canada to identify their needs. In close coordination with communities to ensure necessary resources and supplies such as PPE, bottled water, hand sanitizer, and testing are in place to prevent and combat the spread of COVID-19. In collaboration with Indigenous communities, we will continue to adapt plans and provide surge capacity as the situation evolves. To date, we've shipped 555 orders for PPE, personal protective equipment. In regards to testing, nursing stations and health centres in each region have the supplies required to administer tests, and we are continuously working to ensure a consistent supply as needs arise. We don't currently know how many tests have been administered off reserve for Indigenous peoples. This is because one doesn't have to self-identify as Indigenous during a test. But I support collecting better data. It would be helpful to collect information about patients and whether they are Indigenous. Some of the great work being done in communities, for example, in Aquasasne, which is about to open its mobile testing unit and will be deployed across its territory to increase testing and awareness in the days to come. As of April 17th, there have been 52 confirmed COVID-19 cases in First Nation communities on reserve and 12 confirmed cases in Nunavik Inuit communities, as well as one death. I'd like to extend my sincere condolences to Six Nations of the Grand River. Our thoughts are with the families, loved ones, and community as they, hail, as they heal during this difficult time. While we are thankful for the low number of cases in Indigenous communities to date, we are not taking and should not take this for granted. This is a function of a number of things, notably remoteness of the communities, some of the aggressive measures taken by the leadership, medical and political, in communities, learning from the experience and being in a position to take act of what's gone on across the globe, learning from the good and the bad. Nous savons également qu'avec l'arrivée du printemps, spring is upon us. And with spring comes flooding season. We are currently working with Indigenous communities to ensure that they are prepared for emergency situations, including potential flooding. For example, Indigenous Services Canada gave $2.1 million to the First Nation of Kiseshawan to support their plan to reduce the risks of COVID-19 and the risks of possible flooding in that community. This funding is based on the decision that they made to isolate away from COVID-19 in traditional hunting grounds this spring to hunt goose and practice other traditional practices. This is part of broader public health recommendations to strengthen physical distancing during the pandemic. And the situation and circumstances are very unfortunate. That said, we are very happy to support this initiative because when Indigenous peoples return to the land, that is a very positive and healthy type of physical distancing for them, and physical distancing is so important to prevent the spread of the virus. This new funding and will help purchase supplies, equipment, such as tents. We are supporting these communities throughout this difficult time, and our crisis management team is constantly in touch with the First Nation of Kiseshawan to plan emergency preparedness plans. We continue to recommend that First Nations with upcoming elections not proceed with elections at this time due to the current public health risks associated with large gatherings. Accordingly, 
Last week, we introduced a temporary regulatory option, the First Nations elections, cancellation and postponement regulations that enable First Nations leaders to continue in their positions for up to six or 12 months so that they can stay focused on keeping their communities safe in the face of COVID-19. We've been in direct communication about this option with communities who are currently or will soon be undergoing the election process, and I encourage communities to avail themselves of this option. But I want to be clear, the final decision to hold or postpone elections ultimately lies with community leadership, and we must respect that. Should communities decide to proceed with elections as scheduled, we stand ready to provide advice on measures to minimize the risk of spreading the virus to community members. All this being said, we recognize that more support will be needed. By working together, we can save lives, and we will be there to make sure no Indigenous community is left behind. Miigwech. Nakumik, merci. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Mark. Uh, Dr. Wang. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Dr. Wang. Je voudrais Hello. En I would like to begin les, uh, point important pour la santé by public. highlighting important public First health of all, messages. I want to start by highlighting some very important principles about public health. It is very important to take physical distancing seriously. Avoid crowds, gatherings, avoid non-essential travel, limit contact with people who are at high risks of complications, such as the elderly, people with underlying medical conditions. Isolate if sick and go home if you're sick. It is important to practice hand and respiratory hygiene. We need to stop smoking, stop vaping. Et pour uh, notre tension, uh, il est important de contrôler, uh, it is notre also very et, uh, important to properly poids. manage our blood pressure, diabetes, to make and weight. Sure that we control our cardiovascular and pulmonary diseases as well. So with that, I'm going to say nakumik, miigwech, merci, et thank you. Merci, Dr. Wang. Nous pouvons maintenant passer Thank you, questions. Dr. Wang. And we are now ready to take questions. Thank you, Minister. We will begin by questions over the phone. One question and one follow-up per reporter, and then we'll take questions in the room. Over to you, Operator. First question, Philippe Vincent Foisy, Radio-Canada. Hello, I have a question for Minister Duclos. Minister Duclos, we have extended the border measures with the United States. Have we obtained any guarantees that we will be able to receive essential medical supplies from the United States without any hiccups at the border or without any issues with the Trump administration? Answer, Minister Duclos. Thank you for the question, Philippe Vincent. As you have mentioned, our relationship with the United States is very important in this context and in all contexts. In the current situation, our U.S.-Canada relations are very important. We have conversations with our partners every single day. The border agreement that we reached a few weeks ago has been extended for another 30 days. And we need to ensure the continued flow of essential supplies, food, medicines. You've asked whether we received a guarantee to that effect. Yes, that has been guaranteed. And so we are confident in extending this deal for another 30 days. And of course, we have discussions about other topics with a view to ensuring flow of goods and supplies across the border in both directions. Our Canada-U.S. relations are very important and are very positive, and we work very hard to maintain a good, strong relationship. Uh, so I was um, saying in French what most Canadians already understand, which is that the relationship with our friend and neighbour is not only important in all contexts, but absolutely essential in the current emergency context. We are pleased with the fact that we were able to uh, renegotiate 
the agreement that we had achieved just a few weeks ago for the next 30 days, which uh, uh, achieves a number of different objectives, but one of them is the absolute necessity to keep the movement of essential goods and services across the frontiers, the frontier in both ways, in both directions, because uh, goods go south, goods go uh, north, and those goods, medical, food, and other goods, are absolutely important to maintain the security and the health of Canadians. Um, Follow-up question, Philippe Vincent Foisy, Radio Canada. Question: I have a very specific question about personal protective equipment at the border. Have you received a guarantee from the American government that 3M and other American companies will be able to export medical supplies and protective equipment to Canada? Will we be able to import these supplies from American companies? Have you received a guarantee to that effect from the American government? Will we be able to continue receiving medical supplies and especially personal protective equipment? Answer, Minister Duclos. The watchword is vigilance. These past few weeks, we have observed that essential goods, including medicine, have been able to flow across the border very well. But the motto is vigilance. Yes, we have a very good relationship with the American government, but this relationship will continue to be put to the test over the next few weeks. We, we will remain vigilant to ensure that our Canada-U.S. relationship, which is currently very strong, we will ensure that it continues to remain strong in the next few weeks. The essential discussion and action that we have around the transit of medical goods. I think we first must admit that you know, things are going quite well uh, with efforts on both sides of the frontier, and meaning that we have succeeded in maintaining the appropriate flow of medical goods in both directions, medical goods being essential, obviously, in the current crisis. This being said, we need to be vigilant because that relationship is, uh, is going to be tested for the rest of the crisis. Uh, we have um, we have citizens on both sides of the borders uh, that are of the border that are anxious, that are in need of uh, being reassured, and that's exactly what the responsibility of the federal government is: is to not only to provide the essential flow of those medical goods, but also to reassure Canadians that we will be we will always be working uh, to maintain both the relationship and the movement of those goods. Thank you, Minister. Next question. Our next question, the prochaine question, is from Theresa Wright. Please go ahead. Have la parole. Uh, good morning, uh, Minister Duclos. You said that the numbers are giving uh, us cause for op cautious optimism, and Canadians are starting to see numbers in their provinces improving, and so they're naturally going to question when we can get to the new normal. So what can we tell them? Well, first, uh, two things. Very At a very broad level, yes, there is cause for cautious optimism. This being said, we need to be very mindful that uh, the significant, considerable and difficult efforts that Canadians have been making over the last few weeks need to be maintained. We don't want to lose what we have gained over the last few weeks with the enormous efforts of, uh, of Canadians and governments. So let's be let us be very clear, although we want to be uh, optimistic, we need to be absolutely cautious and maintain the clear guidance of Health Canada, Public Health Canada and all public health officers across Canada, the absolute guidance that we need to maintain physical distancing, wash our hands regularly, avoid, you know, stay at home as much as possible, certainly avoid uh, absolutely non-essential travel. So we really want to keep maintaining our efforts because if we didn't do that, we would end up losing all the gains that we have acquired, that we have made over the last few weeks. Follow-up. 
Thank you. Um, Minister Miller, uh, you mentioned uh, the regulatory changes that you made with regards to First Nations elections, allowing their leaders to continue in their roles for up to six months. But there are some Indigenous leaders who are saying this should have come sooner. A Manitoba First Nation is going ahead with an election, I believe, today. How concerned are you about their safety in this voting process? And why didn't these regulations, uh, regulation changes happen sooner? Well, thank you, Teresa. And in regards to the First Nation that is that is going ahead with its election, we are working closely with them to make sure that it is done, uh, observing the strictest health protocols to ensure that everyone stays safe. Uh, it is ultimately, and if you respect uh, self-determination, is ultimately their decision whether to go ahead or not. You can imagine the immense sensitivity around enacting new regulations under the Indian, Indian Act, uh, which is a, a colonialist instrument uh, that is decried far and wide. And as we move beyond the Indian Act, we must recognize that there are certain First Nations that still operate under it. Um, enacting regulations that give First Nations the flexibility to do that, where I I, uh, as the Minister of Indigenous Services, did not have uh, that ability, um, is an immensely delicate operation. It, it meant um, some level of con uh, consultation to ensure that we were getting it right. We moved as quickly as we can, and uh, knowing uh, the machinery of government uh, in, in respect of enacting regulations and how slow that can be, uh, I'm quite proud at how quickly they moved uh, and the rapidity at which these regulations were put into place. And indeed, there's a mechanism within the regulations, Teresa, that uh, allows f uh, for decisions that were taken previously to postpone um, to, uh, to be considered uh, valid and therefore ensure the continuity of, of, of governance. I, I would not say there was a governance gap created um, under the current clauses of the Indian Act. It was, there was a governance inconvenience in respect of putting power into band managers that may not want to assume the power and the uncertainty uh, around, around, uh, around what leadership uh, tools would be available to address COVID. The focus is on the health response. And so um, these are regulations that are of a temporary nature. They last one year. Uh, they, are, they, they, they expire and then should, uh, they expire after a year and should we need to reenact them, we will assess uh, at that time. But they are very, very narrowly tailored um, put into place, frankly, uh, in record time uh, to address a very, um, a very important set of circumstances, namely to ensure that there is leadership continuity in face of, uh, of a global pandemic uh, with the flexibility allowed and accorded um, to First Nations um, pursuant to their rights uh, of self-determination. So we must respect those choices, um, but we'll be working hand in hand with communities to ensure that those decisions, um, those electoral decisions are, 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 are taken with the most information possible and in the strictest of respect of the current health protocols. Thank you, Minister. Next question. Our next question is from Catherine Lévesque with La Presse Canadienne. Next question. Catherine Lévesque, La Presse Canadienne. Question. Hello. I have questions for Minister Duclos. First, a question about military medics who are being sent into long-term care facilities in Quebec as of today. The government hasn't given us much detail about where they will go. François Legault mentioned the Greater Montreal area, the Estrie region. Could you tell us where these military medics are being sent today? how many are being sent, and to which regions? Answer, Minister Duclos. Thank you for your question. I would like to thank actors in both governments who have worked hard to make this happen very, very quickly. We all recognize the urgency of this situation. The government of Quebec has a primary responsibility to handle the situation, but the federal government is also responsible for quickly stepping in to help after receiving the request that we received. 125 medically trained members of the Canadian Armed Forces will very soon be deployed in Quebec. The government of Quebec will manage their deployment. The government of Quebec will identify its needs, where the needs are on the ground, 
the government of Quebec will also decide what responsibilities these armed forces members will have. Thus far, what we've heard from the government of Quebec is that it is satisfied with how quickly we have stepped in to make this happen. These individuals will be sent to facilities where the needs are most pressing. Quebec will make decisions based on needs on the ground. The government of Quebec is satisfied. That said, the federal government must continue to help in any way that it can given the importance and urgency of the situation. Follow-up question. Question. So I'm getting the impression that you don't know where exactly the needs are most dire. And I have another question maybe you could answer on behalf of Minister Freeland. Earlier this week, there was a first minister's call with the provincial and territorial premiers, and remuneration of essential workers was discussed. Has a deal been reached with provinces regarding regarding salary top-ups for essential workers, what decisions have been taken and what workers will, which workers will receive these top-ups? Answer. We are starting to realize in Quebec and everywhere in Canada that many essential workers are not sufficiently remunerated given how important their work is and given how difficult their working conditions are, especially in this situation. The government of Quebec may have been a bit faster in realizing this than other provinces. And another element that you mentioned is that the government of Quebec wants to help provinces and territories, and everyone wants to help essential workers. As Minister Freeland said, these talks are going well. Everyone is on the same wavelength. Now it's a matter of finding the right ways to act, the right ways for the federal government to provide financial support and salary top-ups. There are jurisdiction issues. The government of Canada, of course, wants to provide support, but must do so in such a way that respects federal, uh, provincial and territorial jurisdictions. And so we are continuing to discuss the issues. Thank you, Minister. And now, questions in the room. Minister Duclos, um, BC's success is credited on uh, with good testing and tracing, and Ontario is being seen to lag behind now. Is the federal government going to step in and uh, mandate provinces to increase testing? And are you concerned that provinces that are lagging behind are going to pull down those that have come ahead? You are absolutely correct in, in describing testing and tracing as being key um, actions in, uh, in the COVID-19 context. Uh, we also uh, understand that different provinces um, face different circumstances, uh, and this is the case in my home province in, in Quebec, and the federal government is always uh, not only uh, willing, but most, most often always able to, to provide uh, guidance that may be helpful in the local uh, circumstances and provide any logistical support and any procurement support when it comes to uh, making equipment and testing um, equipment uh, available to provinces and territories. So we want to do this uh, as, as much as is needed and asked by provinces and territories. And that's what we will continue to do. And with regard to those that are on uh, old age security or disability benefits, uh, those that have a fixed income, um, what's being done for those people who might be facing mounting uh, costs with regard to groceries or transportation or cost of living when they're on a fixed income? And is there any talk with the provinces about making sure that CERB doesn't affect their uh, receiving of federal benefits? Well, that's uh, making ends meet in the current context is a, a large source of anxiety for many Canadians and particularly lower income and vulnerable Canadians. That's why we 
acted very quickly and put into place measures that the federal government certainly never implemented and probably never envisaged, such as the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, but also increasing the GST tax credit, uh, providing support to families of children, in particular families with lower incomes through the Canada Child Benefit. But we, and as the Prime Minister keeps saying, we are uh, working in an emergency situation which requires continuing actions and continuing forms of support. So we are going to continue, as the Prime Minister again said, going to continue uh, being mindful of the anxiety and the difficult circumstances which Canadians are going through, but also renewing and developing our continuing support to those Canadians. Hi, Minister Duclos. Ashley Burke, CBC News. Um, BC is talking about per perhaps uh, easing up some of the restrictions next month if the number of hospitalizations go down, the number of cases go down. At a federal level, what is the bar that we have to meet in order to relax some of these measures? Is it a certain number of cases, is it a certain amount of people in hospital, or is it, uh, you know, the number of tests that we are doing a day? Thank you. Well, that's a very good question, and, uh, and a very good question which Dr. Tam uh, has answered regularly over the last few days. Uh, I'm, I don't have the same expertise and perhaps not the same credibility as Dr. Tam would have in, re in re responding to that important question. But let me, let me summarize what she would probably say. It's around uh, the, the not only the curve, but of course where the curve may be heading. It's also around the capacity of the health system. It's also about uh, the number of deaths, the number of emergency intensive care units that are needed. Uh, and it's about the ability of workers to be protected, to be protected in the environments in which they would have to work. It's about the ability of, uh, of securing enough equipment in, uh, under different scenarios. But since we have Dr. Wong, and since Dr. Wong is probably a, a, a lot more expert and certainly a, mot, a lot more credible than I would be uh, in that area, perhaps, Dr. Wong, you would like to add your own uh, view? Uh, thank you. Um, a number of uh, factors that um, we all have to actually look at, um, as uh, Minister Duclos had just said, um, we have to actually look at, you know, not just, uh, you know, the curve where it's going, but also we have to look at uh, the local and the community and the provincial and the, the national picture, because it depends on the interface uh, between different factors, all of those really determine how one uh, you know would uh, consider perhaps easing some measures in one situation and not easing uh, some measures in other situations. So, thank you. Um, and I'm also wondering how many blue med medical tents does the department have ready to send to communities, and when exactly would that happen? Are you sp speaking to Indigenous communities? Exactly. Not just from, uh, we, I believe we have that number. We have uh, secured additional blue med facility. They can be used for different uh, different solutions, whether it's isolation or testing. Uh, it depends on the needs of the community. And it's really, as we look at the pandemic plan and the possible expansion, which has, hasn't occurred in, in communities, but th we have to examine and consider those possibilities, we will ramp up resources. We have uh, a number in stock available uh, and in the process of being deployed into communities that have asked for it um, and have it um, as part of their pandemic plan. Uh, I don't have those precise numbers, uh, nor do I have the ones in stock. It's a it's very much a moving variable as we as we ramp up capacity and as we recognize that there may be surges in communities. Um, but it, it, it's it's very much something that uh, that we that we are assessing on the fly. But we do have a number of them prepared to be deployed and have been deployed in some circumstances. I'll let Tom uh, answer more directly. Thanks. Um, you know, with these uh, um, mobile structures, um, we are looking forward to supporting Indigenous communities uh, in order to expand the capacity uh, to deal with uh, uh, overcrowding issues temporarily uh, while addressing the, the longer-term housing uh, challenges as well, trying to actually create a safe space to, in order to actually provide um, uh, services such as uh, testing, um, such as uh, taking the swaps, such as, uh, you know, isolation. Um, as well as uh, overflow, you know, for um, uh, temporary uh, medical help or nursing help in the community. All of those, uh, you know, are part of, uh, uh, you know, a comprehensive approach that we take. Thank you. Okay, turning back to the phone, operator. 
Thank you. Our next question, notre prochaine question, is from Mélanie Marquis avec La Presse. Please go ahead. À vous la parole. Mélanie Marquis, La Presse, Merci. question. Uh, pour, uh, Duclos, on de My la question is for Minister Duclos. You spoke about how the Canada-U.S. relationship will be tested in the upcoming weeks. When Trump expresses, expresses impatience and a strong desire to reopen the American economy, does that worry you? Well, as an economist, given the current circumstances, if we want to reopen the economy, then we must be very, very cautious, especially when it comes to public health. We have made major sacrifices these past few weeks. We have been isolated. We have felt anxious. And we have also made economic sacrifices. People have lost their jobs. People are having difficulty making making ends meet. So we always have to weigh public health outcomes and economic outcomes. In the next few weeks and the next few months, we will have to be very, very cautious. Of course, many of us are anxious to reopen the economy. That said, we must absolutely follow the recommendations of our public health experts. We must take the necessary public health measures if we want to reopen the economy. Follow-up question. Mélanie Marquis. All right, so that was your economist point of view. Now, what's your point of view as a Canadian, as a Canadian citizen? President Trump wants people and goods moving around freely again as, as soon as possible. How do you feel about that? Could that compromise public health and safety here in Canada? Answer, Minister Duclos. No, I'm not worried. Our public health experts are very trustworthy here in Canada. Moreover, our municipalities, our provinces, our territories are doing such an excellent job when it comes to public health and spreading public health messages. I think we can be very proud to be Canadian right now. Our health care system is robust, and at some point, we will reopen the economy. The federal government has a very solid financial position, so we will be able to roar back at some point. And when when we want to roar back, it will be essential that all levels of government cooperate and work together, all while respecting public health measures. So when we're ready to roar back, all levels of government will work together and we will reopen the economy. Thank you, Minister. That concludes today's press conference. The uh, federal uh, cabinet ministers briefing and public health officials briefing, just a few ministers there uh, today. Uh, let me give you a, a little bit of information that came from Treasury Board President Jean-Yves Duclos, and that is in relation to the Can Canada uh, Relief Emergency Benefit, uh, the CERB, that many of you uh, have now tapped into because you have lost work or lost your jobs due to COVID-19. He says there have now been 7.9 million applications, just to give you a sense of how much the economy is struggling and how many of you are too are also turning to the government for support. The CBC's Catherine Cullen has been listening along with us. Um, Catherine, I'm not sure if anything else stood out for you there. I mean, we did get some new numbers on um, COVID outbreaks in different Indigenous communities, um, but I'll let you take it where you want to go. Well, let's talk a little bit about what Jean-Yves Duclos said, uh, Rosemary, when he was asked about the transport of personal protective equipment across the Canada-U.S. border. Uh, I thought it was interesting that he said, you know, they're going to have to remain vigilant on this particular issue. Uh, and he did note that while the Canada-U.S. relationship is a good one, it's one that has been tested and he said would continue to be tested over the course of the next few weeks. Uh, that goes back to the point that we were talking about before this news conference started, right? That the government of Canada does not, or, or government officials don't 
don't want to explicitly say, it seems, uh, what a great source of concern the United States is, and particularly some states, just as we see a different picture across the various provinces and territories in Canada. Of course, the picture seems to change from state to state, too. Mm -hmm. A lot of attention, understandably, being paid to New York State. Uh, the government doesn't want to say that it is a significant concern, but obviously this extension, this 30-day extension on the border closure or border restrictions, whatever you want to call it, um, is a, a source of some, I suppose, relief to the government as they try mm -hmm. to deal with a large number of other issues. And we heard that recurring conversation uh, once again with the Prime Minister today, today with uh, Jean-Yves Duclos as well, this question of when Canada can start to talk about restarting the economy, uh, some getting life back to some semblance of normal. It is very clear that this is uh, a situation that is going to change from region to region, notably from province to province, territory to territory. Uh, and everybody keeps saying the watchword here is caution, that this needs to be done cautiously and carefully. There is obviously incredible concern about uh, easing things too quickly and seeing a major resurgence. Certainly everyone is looking at examples, yes, uh, south of the border, but also more broadly internationally. Uh, I think Singapore comes to mind of places mm -hmm. where they are trying to restart the economy, trying to restart society, uh, but concerned that, the, that one false move could lead to a major outbreak. I would note as well something we've been talking about over the course of this program, which is the situation in long-term care homes. Uh, and while they may be in some ways isolated from society more broadly, uh, they're obviously a major source of concern right now. And, a, and a, it's a significant contribution, I guess we can say, to the number of deaths we're seeing in Canada right now. Yeah, and, and probably it will look, as you said, not only different uh, region to region, but probably it'll look different, it, it, you know, in terms of society. You know, um, mm -hmm. I, 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 vulnerable people, seniors, older Canadians will probably be living under different restrictions than other people for some time because they are the ones that are most susceptible. So you can see a sort of... Uh, you know, of ramping up of measures or a, a ramping down of measures, I guess yes. I mean, so that, as I suggested, you know, maybe parks open so you can go and kick around a soccer ball, and, but restaurants only open at 50% capacity. We are seeing some of that happening in other parts of the world, and so that does give us mm -hmm some indications of how, what it might look like. I would also say that um, although the public, uh, Dr. Tam was not there today, Jean-Yves Duclos said there have now been more than 500,000 tests in the country, that they remain cautiously optimistic um, about what they are seeing. But again, uh, Catherine, I think everyone's saying it, it, we can't let go now because then everything that we've done for the past four or five weeks uh, will be lost potentially. That does uh, raises a couple points, one about testing, but also if I can echo Dr. Tam for a minute because we've been listening to her day in and day out and we know sometimes perhaps what she might say, uh, something we've heard from her repeatedly is this question of the curve, right? And mm -hmm. yes, perhaps you've reached the peak, but that's only 50% of the cases, and you have to be certain. Uh, we've heard her say time and time again, uh, be mindful of what happens on the way back down, because that is about 50% of the cases. And so, so, again, the need for ongoing vigilance. We'd also talk about testing as well, a question that our colleague Ashley Burke raised when speaking with the Prime Minister. Uh, she pointed to uh, research out of Harvard University, which suggests that for the United States to sort of open things back up, they'd need to be doing something in the neighborhood of half a million tests or up, upwards of that. And Ashley asked the Prime Minister, whether there was a specific number that he had been advised of for Canada in terms of the level of testing that would be needed. He did not certainly uh, really even come close to engaging in specific numbers, but did say that that too is something that is uneven mm -hmm. across the country, where there are some jurisdictions that are doing well. Uh, you could see him sort of pausing and trying to choose his words carefully. Uh, he said that there are other jurisdictions that are still working on it, let's mm -hmm. say, trying to improve their efforts. That is one piece of the puzzle. Uh, you know, you talk about kicking around the soccer ball and uh, I think that's a very nice mental image for a lot of us right now, <laughs> something we're all yearning to do. But obviously there are decisions too about yeah. what the picture looks like. Uh, I, I thought as well when you were speaking of what's happening in uh, the discussion, I should say, that's happening in California, the governor there talking about the prospect of, okay, well, perhaps we, we would um, reopen restaurants, but menus would be disposable mm -hmm. and, and all the different uh, precautions that would have to be taken. And you can imagine that just one false move would cause everybody to, to snap back as well. So it's really a very dynamic conversation, but one that I think people are very hungry for answers to as well. For sure, for sure. Catherine Cullen, thank you for all your help with our coverage today. I do appreciate it very much. Uh, I wanna turn now to Maria Alonso. She is an ER nurse at St. Paul's Hospital in downtown Vancouver, and she joins us from there. Maria, hi, good to see you. How are you doing? Hi, good morning, I'm, a, I'm doing good. 
Good. <laughs> um, we wanted to talk to you because you've made the decision that some other frontline health workers have made, um, and that is that you are not living with your family right now to protect them. So tell me what you are doing. Um, I just, I just, I just checked out from the hotel yesterday. Um, I just finished my work set, so I'm off right now. Um, yeah, I'm trying to to spend the time with them right now, especially with my son and my mom. But you are typically staying in a hotel. Is that what you're doing? Yeah. So what happened is our uh, is um hospital support to the staff that if you're living with your family and you traveling far from to your work, you have the uh, you have the chance to um to stay during your work time. Mm -hmm. So they're giving, that's one of the support that they're giving to the staff right now. Oh, that's good. Um, tell me how you are in terms of uh, equipment, masks, gloves, gowns, are, 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 do you have enough or is that a concern for you? Um, at the moment in our hospital, we have enough so far. Um, we have enough supply with the protected measures right now we have the face mask we have the n95 the, the the face shield we have all of that stuff right now we i think we have enough supply so far how do you feel going into work every day because we know that as well as older canadians the people that are most vulnerable are our healthcare workers and we have even seen uh, a number of deaths how, how worried are you going into work every day um well, you know, working in emergency is very challenging, um, but this pandemic is quite different. Um, so every time I go to work, I always have the fear that I might infect my family. You know, I always I have a fear that I might get infected as well. So I just need to be more, more, um, more careful in my at work so that I will not um, pass it over to my loved ones and family. Well, particularly your mom, right? Who's in her 70s, I guess, and, and yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, my mom is 73 years old, so um, they are, well, they are um, she's in the high risk right now. So I'm actually really, really careful and really distant from her at this time. So, you know, so we just need to protect our family, really. Maria, is, is there anything else you need from the government? Is there anything else that w would be of help for you to do your job uh, more easily? Um, I, know our, I know our country is doing their best to support all the Canadians. And, uh, and then as, as a nurse, so we're just doing our, we're just actually doing our best to protect our patients, to protect ourselves, to protect our family. But then I think um, the government is doing a good job at this time. So I think we just need to work together and we will get through this pandemic. Well, Maria, thank you for your work because you're doing, you're doing all the hard work for all of us and we appreciate it. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's Maria Alonso in Vancouver. Of course, across the country, Canadians are trying to find ways to help others affected by COVID-19. Senator Jim Munson of Ottawa Rideau Canal is one of those helpers. This is how he's doing it, though. It might, it might surprise you what he's doing here. He plays recreational hockey with a group of old timers. <coughs> I'm sure he won't be offended when I say that. Uh, but when the season uh, was cut short, uh, his fellow league members decided to do something. Good to see you, Senator. Good to see you. Just another Senator Rosie not playing hockey. <laughs> That's right. There's a lot of them these days. Um, so, so you have this league. I guess it's like a you know a, a fun a fun league, a recreational league. Um, and we are the legends. We are the legends. You're the legends. Okay. And it got it got shut down obviously because no one's able to do anything. And and what did you guys decide to do? Well, it was a unanimous decision. We got shut down because of COVID nineteen on March the thirteenth, Friday the thirteenth, and no more hockey. But we had lots of money left and we had a refund of four thousand two hundred dollars so our chief organizer who thought he you know he's going to get a tax to a donation back a refund back he topped it up to make it seven thousand dollars so we had all of this money in the kitty now we're not trying to blow our own horn uh, rosie but we're trying to show <laughs> other hockey teams across the country what they can do so seven thousand dollars is gone to the ottawa food bank the ottawa mission which is helping of course those people who live on streets and those who need a safe bed and 
now is the time, it's even a more important time uh, to help others. So $7,000, we like to look at this as, a, as a, an ice hockey movement, not a grassroots movement, but an ice hockey movement. And we are encouraging other beer league teams across the country and people involved in figure skating clubs uh, to donate money to their charity, even if you have a credit for next year. It's not much money, but it, at least it, it, it does something and it shows that you know, for the sake of a few more wings and too many beers uh, <laughs> that we can get back, get back to our community. No, it's a smart idea because obviously this is the first wave of some sports being shut down. But, you know, I'm not sure soccer and, and other things are going to be starting up uh, quickly anytime soon. So there may be other places where, where that will work, too. Well, yeah, of course it will. We, we're, we, there are other names that we could have used, like the, the Rusty Blades, but that was taken. So <laughs> we, a lot of us feel that we're legends in our own minds. And so we, with, our <laughs> hashtag, with our hashtag, Hockey Legends Help, uh, we feel that uh, this is $7,000. This could grow to $70,000 to $700,000 across the country. And perhaps even those soccer teams that you talk about, uh, they may have money lined up to, to, to start practicing and start playing. Well, they can't right now. But even that money, even a bit of that money could go a long way. And an individual figure skater or individual hockey player could use the money, the refund, uh, to help a charity of his or her choice. Yeah, it's a good idea. Senator, I'm going to ask yeah. you one, uh, one, the other part of your job question, if that's okay. Yesterday or the day before, I'm losing track of time, the Senate decided that it would continue, it would suspend sitting until I think the beginning of June. As you know, uh, the House of Commons is grappling with that right now, uh, and they have yet to reach an agreement on what's going to happen on Monday. What, what are your thoughts on, on that? My thoughts on that is that we have to be responsible. Our committees can meet virtually. We can pass legislation uh, if legislation comes to us, but we think it's extremely important to live and work by example and work from home, and that there's no place we should, we should not be uh, sitting in the Senate of Canada. Canadians have been asked to stay at home. We can also work from home, and we can get our jobs done, whether it's advocacy or whether it's legislation. So we have postponed until June 2nd. Doesn't mean our work is, is not done. But I think that um, traveling across the country at this time is, is not a very smart thing to do. Uh, it's, uh, what are we doing? We're staying home and we're working and we're still enjoying our families and we're, and we're giving back. And as politicians, I think that we have to be very, very cautious, very cautious. You, uh, you probably were in the Senate, though, over the past couple of weeks to help with the legislation because you are in, 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 the, in the region. And, and mm -hmm. did, it, did it work? Was it, were there any problems with a limited number of people there? We had 26 uh, senators there, and, uh, and everybody spoke uh, on the pieces of legislation that, that was before us. And there was uh, physical distancing, uh, six feet. Um, it, it worked, and it can work again. But I think yeah. it has to be work on an individual basis when pieces of legislation come to us in that way. I mean, the thought of having a virtual parliament, it can work, but it's, that's, that's another work to be done. Yeah. In the meantime, we have created in our Senate, uh, our Social Affairs Committee, and our finance committee to meet and to hear witnesses to take account of what's the government doing or not doing and how society is coping. So we can still sound as a, a chamber of sober second thought and listening to Canadians' concerns. Sure. Senator, good to talk to you about politics and uh, beer league hockey and, and your contributions don't, to people. Don't, don't forget to give, you know, stay on the ice, but do it through money. You know, Thank it's an ice hockey movement. Thank you, Senator. Good to see you as always. Stay healthy. Thanks, Rosie. You too. Okay, and we are going to uh, leave things there today. A couple of announcements I'll just remind you of, important, uh, that the U.S.-Canada border uh, ha will remain closed for another 30 days to non-essential travel. I'm Rosemary Barton. I'll see you back here for our special coverage tomorrow. Michael Serapio continues right now.